Well, hello and good morning, everyone. I'm very honored to be here and to be able to kickstart the day with you all with some futures thinking and to lay the ground for the rest of the amazing program that you, that you have for today. My name is Nicholas and I represent one of the oldest think tanks in the world devoted to studying the future. It's the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies and it was founded approximately 50 years ago. We are a publicly beneficial think tank that works to inspire and equip individuals and organizations to act on the future today, as we say. In my daily work, I work towards the public uh, together with educational and cultural institutions. Um, more specifically, I'm a part of the UNESCO uh, Global Futures Literacy Network and a part of FORMS, Future Oriented Museum Synergies, as we have aspirations here in Copenhagen to open the doors or a, um, to a physical institute where the public can come and engage with the future. Um, I'm also working with a local museum on democratizing the future through art, tech, te uh, technology and design, uh, which I hope to be able to share with you later on. Um, but all of this is just to say that I'm really excited to be here with you today as we have uh, shared common ground in, in looking towards how museums as a platform can can transform. And as we're going to use the chat later, I'm just going to warm you up a little bit and we'll ask you to write the first word that comes to the top of your mind when you think about the future in the chat. Please do that now. Thank you. Just trying to get it up here on my screen as well. There we go. Hope, dangerous, shiny, new technologies, possible, blue. Lots of questions, great. Um, the future as a field of work and a field of study is developing very quick these days. And it is it's doing so for several reasons. The current being, the, uh, the pandemic being the current main one, we are seeking to understand how our lives might look on the other side. Um, there's a clear and new, renewed interest in the future on so many levels, which we can use today as a springboard. Um, there is momentum, and I will start this presentation by giving you an introduction to the field and some terminology. First, there's some key principles when we talk about the future. First of all, the future does not exist. It can only be imagined. So we can train our way to imagine how we think about the future. As a discipline, it was established uh, 70, approximately 70 years ago. There are multiple futures, as many as you can imagine. Some of them are less probable and some of them are more. The future is not predetermined. We have alternatives. Hence, we often explore scenarios when we engage with the future. The future is not predictable, but it can inform our actions in the present. We do have choices. And lastly, the future can be influenced. There are consequences of our actions today for future generations. Now, what you see here is, um, is a graphic that's trying to lay out the uh, relation between the different terms that I just want us to get straight from the beginning here. Futurism, the wider circle, refers to a wide variety of approaches to explore the future, including arts, science fiction, opinions about the future and layman speculations. Now, this is a term that refers much broader to the future uh, than future studies and foresight that you see in the middle. So we can represent the relation between the three like we see here on the screen. Um, future studies that you see on the left, as the name says, it's a field of the holistic and systematic study of alternative futures. Foresight, on the other hand, uh, refers to application of future studies methods and techniques by organizations and governments to be prepared for the future, which implies studying the future to act in the present. And that's why foresight is a part of strategy. And that's why you have also heard it uh, named as strategic foresight. So the point being here is that you see the tools in the middle are shared between future studies and foresight, but they're just used for different things. So we both use megatrends and scenario planning, but when we do it in future studies, it's 
You could say that it's for research purposes when we do reports, exploration, and for foresight, it's because we want to optimize our strategy. If we want to, we want to explore the future to adapt and to innovate. Now, future studies and foresight you see here on the left, that is, um, that is to say that it, is a, it has formed a tradition of practice. On the right side, we have futures thinking. And often future studies, foresight and futures thinking are words that are like mixed together and used, um, and used differently. But we wanna keep it, we wanna try to like draw a, a straight uh, a line in the sand here and then say future studies and foresight is the practice and futures thinking is the cognitive level. The former is the practical level, the latter is the psychological level. Now, when we try to depict that there is different futures ahead of us, we often use what we call the futures cone that shows us that there are alternative and likely futures ahead of us. And make sure that uh, you make notice of the futures in plural here, because there are, as we see here, plenty futures ahead of us. This cone represents everything beyond the present moment. And then it goes from possible, plausible, probable to preferable futures. It's a very popular way of showing how we can examine different futures to understand how we can make better decisions in the present. The possible futures are the futures that we think might happen based on future knowledge that we do not yet possess, but which we think we might possess someday. The plausible futures are the futures we think could happen based on current understanding of how the world works. And I just get some morning sun in here, bear with me. Um, Probable futures are the futures we think are likely to happen, usually based on quantitative data and extrapolation of current trends. And then we have the prefer, uh, preferred futures, which are the futures we think should or is ought to happen based on a norm normative approach, as opposed to the other ones that are more cognitive here. Um, the point here is that future studies does not try to predict the future. It investigates alternative futures systematically. And that's why you can see here around the preferred futures, that's where we often explore scenarios in order to be better prepared in the preferred space and to see how we can influence the present um, towards our preferred future. Human beings have always imagined alternative futures and attempted to ad anticipate what might come down. Um, in her paper, A Brief History of Futures, Dr. Wendy Schultz has divided the history of futures into five waves, uh, five waves of, of development with oral storytelling and extending it to the present day. So if we go through this, we have the oral tradition first. This is where shamans and the mystics and the priests read science and nature and the divine to try to anticipate the future. The second wave is the early written age. Here macro historians start to look for patterns in the past and for cycles of repetition. In the third wave, we have the age of enlightenment and extraction. The idea of progress is born through science here. We have the fourth wave, which is systems and cybernetics. After industrialized total war, future techniques are accelerating. Forecasting and systems operations are maturing, either to rebuild society after the war or to prepare for future wars. There is a saying that there's two, two schools emerging here where the European is the more holistic one that tries to explore the future to rebuild society. And the American, the US version um, and school of thinking is more uh, occupied with gathering intelligence um, for strategic purposes. This is here future studies emerges as a discipline, as a field of study. And that takes us to the fifth wave, the age of complexity and emergence. And we stand in the right beginning of that right now. This is where futures theory is being integrated in institutions across the world melding with other disciplines and moving beyond historically Western framings. Now, if we ask ourselves what the state of the world is, we could look at a large worldwide Gallup analysis that was out in 2019 saying that we are more angry, sad and worried than ever before. Others are calling our time the age of mass protests 
based on a decade long trend of increase in political protests. Now, I think it's fair to ask whether we have outlived some of our systems and our solutions as our problems are demanding us to think beyond our current lifetimes. Are we, able, are we unable to grasp the fact that each moment of our present is an expression of our legacy? And who is it that owns the future? That's obviously a rhetoric question. And the point is that we need, we need to empower and engage more folks in our collective futures from this point. And it's already happening. Millions of people are marching the streets worldwide. Fridays for the Future and the more radical Extinction Rebellion have both reached sophisticated organization and global reach. Point, uh, people want a seat at the table and increasingly claim a stake at the future they desire. While future studies and foresight as a field have continued to be a centralized organizational and institutional capacity, it's often confined to practitioners, futurists, the, embodied, uh, the commissioning bodies, and however, democratization is catching up with the field. The broader inclusion of diverse agents in their perspectives is now being considered to expand the visibility of the future and promote further engagement, engagement with it. This is reflecting how previous exclusive process is opening up. But the question remains, where is the public entry point for public imagination about the future? When we think about the future, we tend to extrapolate current knowledge, especially about around sorry, techno technology and technological progression. It's much easier for us to grasp and imagine, but it leads us to a dangerously narrow window of imagination where technology tends to be the center rather than being a tool for us to achieve our aspirations. We need wide ranging ideas, opinions, visions for members of our uh, for members of our society to be able to adapt to the evolving world around us. There's a new school of thinking that is maturing, being developed by key actors calling for more participatory practices and decisions. An example of such is participatory budgeting, which is recommended by both the World Bank and the UN as a good practice conserved with uh, involving citizens in budgets to bridge the distance between government decisions and ensure uh, representation. While one of the first uh, well-documented examples of participatory futures projects dates back to the 1970s Hawaii, where a year-long project was supposed to imagine how the island state should be looking in the year 2000, participatory futures have not yet matured and become mainstream, uh, a mainstream adoption. More recently, however, the president of France has been out advocating for democratic conventions and the European Union has over several projects allowed for citizens to take part in identifying the priorities and concerns and ideas that should shape the roadmap for Europe tomorrow. While participatory and democratic processes is not necessarily a new phenomenon, it's giving way for, public, for, for the public to engage with the future uh, beyond dreaming, fiction, and Hollywood. Participatory futures have begun to emerge. It's the combination of public engagement and futures work. The idea is that it can enable ways to galvanize public imagination and foster agency and collective action towards more aspired public futures. To engage more people in participatory futures, we need to foster a newly described skill called Futures Literacy. It's a body of work established by UNESCO under Real Miller. It's a capability approach to futures. And like other literacies, it's arguing uh, that reading, writing, financial lit literacy, digital literacy, it's something that you should engage with, uh, with and train in order to become good at it. Futures Literacy helps us identifying our anticipatory assumptions and rethink our decisions and make us able to prompt new questions and make new thinking. It can help us to become aware of our assumptions, to imagine the future, and most importantly, to change our perspective from fear and innovate towards hope instead. A futures literate person is aware of anticipatory assumptions and anticipatory systems and uses multiple futures to innovate the present to make better decisions. 
And um, let's dig a little deeper into that. When leaning into the future, we can do it through three anticipatory systems, three essential ways of using the future. The first one being planning for optimization and probably the most common ways of using the future. This is where we develop or improve our existing systems and practices, whether we're working from home or if it's live during lockdown or if it's our company's COVID-19 strategy. The second one is preparing for contingency. Here we are readying ourselves for something that might happen like a second wave of the pandemic or environmental disasters. The goal here is not to optimize, but to be prepared for what might come down if, uh, if shock should occur. And then we have the last one, which is about being open to novelty and emergence. This is about engaging with futures we not necessarily can make sense of today. It includes asking ourselves what the needs of the planet are and what might the needs be of future generations. This latter one is the more difficult one and is the one that is often a little disregarded in, in much of future's work already. As you can see, and if you think about how you engage with the future, I'm sure you could also acknowledge that it's the first two that you spent most time on. The point is that all these three are equally important. Using all three is what UNESCO called walking on two legs. If we can let go of a certain assumptions about the future, we may realize things that we, can that we took for granted and we may open up for spontaneity and other possibilities. Imagine the future of museums. We're now back at the idea that there are multiple futures, something you can hope for and something you can expect, which is either your preferred future or your probable future. Aware, a way to become aware of one's anticipatory assumptions about, to, about the future is to explore the differences between what you expect and what you hope for. Anticipatory assumptions are the arguments from which we construct our images of the future, such as the sun will come up tomorrow, like it is doing right here right now. Um, I will get dinner tonight. Museums are not meant to be community platforms or could they be so in the future? These are all assumptions that we have that paints the picture of our shared futures. Now, I hope you're ready for a little futures literacy exercise. A key component in futures literacy is reframe scenarios that challenge the status quo and conventional ways of thinking. I will now ask you to sit tight and I will take you on a little time travel. We're going to use the future as a lens, as a pair of glasses that will help us to become aware of our assumptions, the shape of our glasses, if you will. I will now read up a reframe scenario for you and let you sit with it for a minute. And then we will go through three questions to which you can answer, uh, type your answers in the chat. The year is 2050. For the last 30 years, people increasingly challenged the status quo. They now claim a stake in how history is being archived and communicated. The main concern for the world has become the legacy we leave behind for generations to come. Since 2020, the physical and digital spheres have blurred and social media has taken the public square online. We embrace the increased individuality that came with the internet, but we have now realized a sense of emptiness, a sense of loneliness and lack of shared visions. Based on the insufficiencies in gathering, debating and imagining collectively online, it has now been decided that educational and cultural institutions like museums and libraries now need to emancipate the power of the visitors, move beyond brick and mortar to facilitate change, sustainable change in their communities. In this future, the role of the curator can no longer stay with the traditional holders and the responsibility must be decentralized. Now, the point of a reframe is that you let it happen. You don't try to fight it. You buy the premise and accept what you might get to think. So if, we, if you just would take a minute and as soon as you're ready, tell us in the chat how you respond to this reframe. 
and how you would organize. In this future, the role of the curator can no longer stay with its traditional holders. I will share the reframe again. The year is 2050. For the last 30 years, people increasingly challenged the status quo. They now claim a stake in the history, how history is being archived and communicated. The main concern for the world has become the legacy we leave behind for generations to come. Since 2020, the physical and digital spheres have blurred and social media has taken the public square online. We embraced the individuality that came with the internet, but we have now realized a sense of emptiness, loneliness, and lack of shared visions. Based on these insufficiencies in gathering, debating, and imagining collectively, it has now been decided that educational and cultural institutions like museums and libraries now need to emancipate the power of the visitors and move beyond brick and mortar to facilitate sustainable change in their communities. In this future, the role of the curator can no longer stay with its traditional holders and the responsibility must be decentralized. How does it make you feel? And how do you respond to this reframe? There's no right or wrong here. Just try to let it sink in and tell us what you think. What's holding you back? Diane says it makes her think about a messy but inclusive future, just wondering how museums could set their priorities. What kind of priorities, Diane? adding the other questions here that you can also think about. There we go. In 2050, museums will be transformed. They won't be the same as now. To whom museums should give more space in their buildings and program. We face multi-crisis today. It might be worse in the future. Where to set priorities? Anyone else that wants to chip in?
some respond, sorry, some respond can only be found while working with different professionals, collaborating and sharing ideas. Museums as a collective space to think and design shared futures, yeah? On YouTube, Barbara Kay is saying, I like the idea and I don't feel like it's a radical reframe. Museum staff have to get off their desks. I am missing the collective aspect of social media because I'm building a little hope on it. That's a good one. One assumption could be museums still have buildings in the future. We never know. Museums seem to be very confined with their brick and mortar. And what if they could include the city as a platform, for instance? As persons, we can organize ourselves personally, but acting as a whole museum, there has to be created a common sense among all the workers, all the colleagues, sharing, understanding, and acting. Museum act as an archive exploring forming of visual gather virtual gatherings using AR. The future of museums in society in which we live. Museum as a living participatory experience and experiment like Dao movie. This is exactly what I'm talking about and what this reframe exercise is supposed to provoke, supposed to provoke new thinking. If we roll a little bit back and go back to the present, the idea is that reframe scenarios help us to look at the conditions of change and change the conditions of change. So we better can understand what happens in different futures. And we can become aware of our anticipatory assumptions and start challenging them and open up our minds for different futures ahead. Mindful of time, I will continue this exercise is obviously a, supposed to get us think about the public square and reimagine the public, public square. While the pioneering museums of tomorrow in Rio, the Futurium in Berlin, and the soon to open Museum of the Future in Dubai are presenting immense societal and cultural value in establishing familiarity with the long term, traditional museums and public institutions have an interactive opportunity before them. An opportunity to reinstate the public square and decentralize the future. An opportunity to transform the audience into participants and help them challenging inadequate imaginations fueled by hegemonic images of the 20th century where the white male is the superior ruler. The significance of climate protests, feminism, movements like Black Lives Matter, foster new and alternative collective material that has otherwise been proscribed to us. Material that does not only give way to marginalized groups, women and kids to reimagine themselves, but enables new public shared images of new and desired futures and what it means to be human being. If we open ourselves to this obligation in fostering futures literacy and enriching collective imagination, we can create public platforms that dare to encounter differences and other worldviews and challenge any predisposed beliefs. Participatory futures welcome the figure of the individual to challenge boundaries and identify the seeds of change for a new tomorrow. In order to become agents of change and foster change in communities, we need to not only foster futures literacy, but increase our futures consciousness. Here, the fifth dimension of futures consciousness is the most important because once a person understands time perspective, has an agency, sense of agency and agency belief, appreciates the diversity and unpredictability of the future and the potential future and observes the environment with a critical mind, the question becomes, where, what, are they gonna go to, what are they gonna do with it? What sh future should they aim for? This fifth building block in dimensions of futures consciousness draws together the characterizations of values, morals, and ethical thinking. This dimension emphasizes the capacity for being concerned about committing oneself to bettering not only one's own future, but the future of others, the future of society, 
and the future of generations yet unborn as well. It's about time that we realize uncertainty is a permanent feature in society and engaging with the future allow us to use it as a resource in so many ways. Seen from this perspective, the pandemic is not only a tragedy, but also a chance to end outlive structures, plant new seeds, as well as an opportunity for positive ad adaptation and benefit. It's time to change the way we engage with the future by turning uncertainty into a resource rather than an enemy. And if we want to democratize futures, we want, must do more than listening. We have to empower. We have to give people a space to understand and unfold where they can create the future for themselves and their communities. And allow me to do a little bit of marketing here towards the end. So if you wish to explore the futures literacy further, there's an upcoming high level futures literacy summit from December 8 to 12 uh, at UNESCO where registration opens soon, where it's about declaring futures literacy as the capability for the 21st century. That's all I have for you folks. Thank you.